Okay. Okay. Uh, we have our five minute break. It's over, I guess. Hope we're ready to start. Um, my presentation will be about running. So supposedly to be sports number two in the ranking we had at the beginning. So I'm Marcel van der Kuil, um, founder of uh, BBO, with the mission to bring data to life, uh, to improve the way we live or lead our life using data. Let's first do a round uh, regarding the sports. Uh, who's into sports, part of a club, or doing something related to sports currently? 100%. Okay, who's doing running? 10%. Uh, for more, more than 10%, good, good, good. Uh, how do you engage with running? How do you experience it? Okay, yeah. twice a week? Try oh, at the frequency. Uh, yeah, try twice a week. Used to be more, but... Uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Did you also raise your hand? Did I see that correctly? Yeah? Yeah? Are you a digital runner? Would you say that? No, no. No? Why do you know you're not a digital runner? Uh, well, because it's nothing digital connected to me. When you're running? Yeah. You're not sharing online? No. Before, during, after? No. Okay. Anybody has a definition of what digital running could be or should be? Uh, because we need to work together to raise our understanding. You measure something. You measure something. Yeah. During running? Yeah. Okay, and who looks at the data? Is that you? Okay, that's a good start. Anybody has a de better definition about what a digital runner could be, should be? How digital, uh, like percentage-wise, Maybe he's a 30% digital runner, and you are 100%. Yours? Just your training schedule, point of view data. Yeah, that's a better one, I think. Maybe you agree? Yeah. It's applying and learning where you can prove that data has played a role. Yeah, okay. Maybe somebody can even up that definition of digital running and maybe digital coaching. <laughs> yeah, the coach needs to play a role, maybe, yeah? in that learning process. He needs to prove as well that in the feedback that he's giving you, if you, he's used your data next to maybe his data with all his coaching experience. And so that's my presentation. Maybe work together with you, so raise me those questions, trying to raise our awareness about what digital running should be in the near future. Because, of course, the observation is that we have all these apps and all these wearables, we have all that data, but maybe we're not learning yet. Yeah? That's maybe a hard observation to make, but that's Basically, what I'm fearing could be the case. We need to improve our learning using the data. Okay, I want to thank uh, Walter for giving me the opportunity, Go Data Driven, uh, Jos for, and Sas for sponsoring me. Glad to be here. I want to say hi to my friend Jago, who should be watching the live stream now, I think from Spain. So, hi Jago, and uh, we're basically ready to go. Okay, this is a good quote, I think, eh? reflecting on what we just reflected on. We have more and more data about our health, but we seem to become less healthier because of maybe all that data. Eh? Because the more we know, eh? more data, more problems. Eh? That could be an observation, because more questions arise. And then the doubt rises, depending on your personality. Eh? You can defeat your enemy by giving him a lot of information, eh? especially conflicting data conflicting data sets containing many data quality issues. That maybe refers to the world we're in when we're looking at sports data. This is my why I'm here now. I, I could be at another place now, could be doing something else, but this is my why. Uh, after I had this severe accident where I broke and fractured parts of my leg, left leg and ankle, I had to recover from, let's say, a valley of despair uh, I was predicted to be in the hospital for five weeks and I came out in three weeks because of my sports background, uh, uh, marathon running, duration sports. Uh, because I was used to seeking, let's say, the threshold of pain and then using that to try to recover after that and then accelerate and accelerate as soon as things started improving. I was lucky. I'm here because I got a second chance. I made a full recovery which wasn't predicted. I had very bad predictions. The wheelchair was, let's say, uh, 
in my perspective, and I fought with everything I had using my data, my personal data, or my observations or perception about it, to beat the odds. To beat the odds, they were really bad. I had a good surgeon, a good nursing team at UMC Utrecht, and I'm really happy to be here and share you my mission and my dream to, let's say, my patient experience to transpose that to what people endure when recovering in sports or recovering from operations, using data and using the interaction with coaches and people that know about recovery or know about, uh, let's say, uh, excelling your uh, performance uh, in general, in life, in work, in sports. My company, I'm heavily into science uh, because I think uh, many things that are happening there uh, deserve, let's say, uh, reinc reincarnation in a commercial context. Many PhDs do fantastic stuff that never passes beyond the borders of the scientific or the university building and ends up in the drawer. I think it's our job, and it's especially mine, to translate, transpose what those PhDs did and make sure it will be, uh, uh, let's say, implemented in practice, brought to life. Uh, that data of that PhD should be brought to life if, if it makes any sense to you or to me. I think we have a job to do. Uh, this is one of the projects uh, about to start in quarter three this year, where we will be looking at the microbiota, so your internal system, uh, which is basically more or less determining how resistant you are to a disease, more, more or less determining what your energy system will behave like under the influence of marathon running. So it's a known observation that many marathon runners suffer from internal issues and don't make it to the finish line. Some say even 50% suffer from some kind of issue. And also the observation is that taking all those gels is doing the wrong thing. It's worsening the issues. So many event managers struggle with this uh, because they want to make more and more people making the finish line and coming back next year. So this is an interesting R&D project together with NOC, NSF and another couple of scientific parties. We expect many great things to come out of this and hopefully improve the way people enjoy marathon running and keep coming back. Second one, Jos was in there like me lipid testing, we looked at cholesterol levels, pinching the finger maybe 20 times a day, at some days doing the baseline, proving that if you involve patients that are knowledgeable, that know something about data, those values that you find about cholesterol levels can be way different than an average GP would find when he would look at you like once a year, once in three years, and then categorize you for life maybe as being at risk or being not at risk at all. That's very dangerous, we think. We will share this in San Diego shortly, uh, this patient-included research, which gave some very interesting observations that the scientific community should know, but I also think the sports community should know, because many elite sports guys and girls I know do this on a regular basis, for example, for lactate levels, to show the level in which they either recover or, let's say, are exhausted or fatigued. So the same devices are even used, I think. Johan is there. Johan was mentioned a few minutes ago. I know Johan pretty well. We're doing a, a project together to improve the way coaches coach their teams using data. So a coach can be a great guy, or the coach can be a girl, being a great girl, but how do you use the data to prove that he, what he's doing is actually working or contributing to the fact that the, the team has won the game? That's very hard to prove what the influence, maybe 10%, 90% of the coach was at the result. Yeah, very interesting. If we support the coach doing a better job, then that, uh, let's say, um, that correlation can be improved, causality even, maybe we can prove that at one point in time. That's our mission. Integrating the data, making sure the coach can do a better job using the data, maybe supporting the people at the sideline, the, doing the notes, and then giving better predictions because you know the coach is doing the right thing, which should mo work for most players. This is my key presentation. There's the banner. It's about the heart rate. Um, maybe the most captured biometric worldwide by people, by laymen, eh? like you and me, 
We're not cardiologists, maybe we're not all data scientists, but by people like you and me capturing heart rate data uh, with the observation that this data is basically dumped, you know. Who does anything with heart rate data? I mean, in average, right? All those millions of people gathering heart rate data, what did I learn from their heart rate data? Anybody in the room has an experience looking at the heart rate data, being coached on it, or learn anything from it? Anybody out of those 100% of people doing sports? You know, I will skip you, okay? Because you, you're presenting. Yeah? Okay. Keep a nice pace your time. Okay. And does that depend on the type of training? What is optimal or time of season or day or? It does matter. Yeah. Yes. But what did you learn especially? Okay, yeah. are you always measuring when training on the bike? Yeah. Mostly. Okay, yeah. That, that's very good. 90%. Yeah, okay, you, you, so you see a benefit. Yeah. It's like a sustainable thing. It helps you like always. Okay, and the other people with some experience measuring heart rate while doing sports? Yeah, at the back? Uh, years ago, with, for marathon training then, then it was really about using your range in heart rate to push your lower limit down so that you yes. at, the, at the same heart rate basically run at a higher pace. Yes. There was one focus and, and on the other hand on the, on the intensity that, that, that you get your peak, uh, your peak power up. Yes, that's like a goal, right? Did you reach it using the data? Okay, and that was back then? It's still there? Okay, why did you give up? Um, I was fed up with, with running uh, more than four times a week. Okay, but also fed up with the measuring maybe, looking at the data. Uh, not necessarily. Okay, okay. If this would be easier for everybody with quick feedback, because the better the feedback, eh, it should be quick, accurate, personal, specific, actionable, uh, you guys in this room know more about feedback than me, maybe. Those are cr quality criteria to make good feedback. Uh, if that could be improved, it would be easier to capture and then receiving the benefits if you're training in the right direction, right? Okay. Um, heart rate, um, learning from the heart rate can improve your running, can improve your hockey, can improve your football. Uh, we're starting with running, though, uh, because this is our team. Um, some uh, famous people, uh, Gert-Jan Wassink at the right, elite athlete, top 20, I think, in the Netherlands, Gerard Nijboer, former Olympian, and some other people from Atletiek Uni uh, that are committed to running and making that something that could work for everybody. Uh, there's about 2.4 million active runners in the Netherlands. That seems to be a bit conflicting with the numbers we just saw, but that's a huge crowd. Uh, worldwide, it's a couple of hundred millions people enjoying running or trying to. They could benefit from data. That's the message. We're doing meetups as well in Papendal uh, with the elite people, but also the amateurs. Jonathan was there. He's in the picture. Yes, he's in the middle. <laughs> so trying to experiment, you know, what could work? Yeah? Because the test that is in the app is the Zolach test. It's a test from the 70s, previous century, you know. <laughs> It took us like 50 years to digitize this, make this digital, because it's a standard protocol which is easy to use and easy to understand by most coaches and most runners themselves if you help them. Uh, we think it's really time now that we start digitizing those known protocols and making it work for the masses, the groups and the individuals. Uh, so we were there uh, doing workshops at Loop Trainersdag also at Dag van Atletiek, sharing these uh, insights with the crowd, with the trainers. Uh, there's a, a lot of trainers in the Netherlands, making sure they, feel they start to get comfortable with using wearable technology while doing a training. Is there anybody in the room uh, in a running team with a coach or trainer? 
No, that's still exceptional. You uh, does it in your group? Does every some some people wear wearables? Mm, yeah, most of them. And the coach, does he do anything with the data? Exactly. Well, we have a group now on Strava where they actually try to bring something together, but it still is very hard, eh? The coach is like 40 plus, 50 plus, some clubs are really hesitant to uh, undermine their authority. <laughs> Using data, we all know that. Eh? Data can undermine authority. A lot of people don't like that. Eh? They think their core competence really relies on other things than silly data. But that should be connected, of course. It can reinforce the coach doing a proper job. But it's a, very, it's a generation thing. Very hard for the older people to trust the data or trust the machine, I think it's maybe hard in general, but we should teach them uh, using the data. We call the app Hatubito. We are targeting Tokyo 2020. Uh, we're trying to be there because they're calling that the innovation games. They're calling out people that have innovations that could work for the crowds to enjoy sports, to participate. We have our app. We hope it's a contender to participate. That's why we use Japanese. Hard to beat, though. Hard beat. It's a funny thing. Uh, that's what we call the app. Why listen to the heart? In puberty already, problems start emerging with plaque, let's say, uh, manifesting itself in your arteries. Uh, maybe not a lot of people know that, but it's good to listen to the heart. Running marathons, if you ask the cardiologist, I don't think he will say it's a good thing. He will say, minimize, listen to your heart, and then minimize again, and then try to recover and measure again before you redo a marathon. Uh, so physically, marathon running doesn't seem to be a good thing. Amsterdam Marathon, I was there. It was pretty severe. Anybody here ran half marathon in Amsterdam? Yeah, you? OK, anybody? It was quite warm that day. Yeah, yeah you at the back? Half marathon? Yes? Yeah, not OK. Last time it was uh, warmer than expected. The asphalt was, uh, let's say, releasing warmth like crazy. I saw people falling down. The ambulance rode out like th 30 times that day. Uh, but what they did uh, in the AMC, looked at people that finished and looked at their heart. And there they saw what many people already know, that uh, the body is issuing, let's say, substances that uh, would also be uh, issued if there's a heart attack. So the heart is indeed scarred. Uh, a, a healthy person will quickly recover, but there's damage at the beginning. That's for sure when people, they, when they run marathons. So that's interesting on the data level again. So how can we lower the risk of high damage? And how can we increase uh, the chance that a person will quickly recover and can maybe measure it himself? Here's the coach. That's why I raised the question like a couple of minutes ago. This guy, I spoke to him during a symposium on uh, uh, injury, sports injury. That was his message. The style of the coach is critical uh, to uh, injury rates and critical to uh, success rates. I, I find that really uh, interesting because on the data level, there, I'm sure you can, let's say, try to backtrace if this is really true for some clubs or other clubs, etc. This is the Zolaj test again, so 70s, old school. Um, if you can extend the reach of where your heart rate zones can be, and if you retest after a proper schedule that's targeted for you with the right coach that can coach you based on heart rate data while training, uh, this could happen. Then you make the jump where you do more meters with the same heart rate. Uh, and this is interesting. This would only not work for runners. This, will only, this could also work for people that do cycling or hockey. Uh, this means you need less energy, less, let's say, intake of gels, for example, to perform on the same level, and then probably recover even faster, and then be ready for the next training even faster. Uh, for you, or for you, that's maybe not too relevant. For elite sports, that's critical, because losing a week heading for a big tournament is, could be yeah, crucial to a loss or a win. Uh, so for elite sports, this is interesting, but also for you and me, if we want to enjoy a healthy life and use that one hour training that you maybe have per week to the max. If the outcome of your one hour running is like maximized, uh, you could run less and have the same benefits. 
And if you have a high load work schedule, like some of you in this room maybe, this is interesting. One hour of running could bring you more, properly coached with heart rate data, than three hours of running when you do it just on your gut feeling. That's really interesting. It's a strong business case. Also on the society level, if more people s learn how to enjoy running in the proper manner, we could have a big benefit yeah, where we can reduce injuries, improve health, etc. This is my closing slide, assuming last minute. Um, maximum heart rate, does anybody know his, hers, maximum heart rate? Currently, <laughs> you'll see. <laughs> <laughs> now, that was a year ago. <laughs> now, we did a quantified self-experiment, a very simple protocol, very easy to use, a bit risky because reaching your peak could make you fall down or something. It's always a risk to engage in sports in general. We all know that, basically. But uh, we showed that people don't know their maximum heart rate. Most people don't know what that is. So if you're downloading a schedule to do a marathon, if you don't know this input parameter, your schedule is suboptimal. You either run too fast or too slow. We also uh, showed that the rule of thump, 220 minus your age, is not a good approximation. It's a good guess, but uh, the real measurement uh, was also there, and it was higher in almost all cases, and people were surprised that with a simple protocol, they could really he uh, hit a peak value that they maybe never saw before. That was thrilling, of course, uh, because that gives you a stress level stress input because it's maybe dangerous giving you new input. But it's interesting because, again, for elite sports, uh, this is crucial to know, but I think it's good to know for everybody. With data, with our How to Beto app, uh, we hope to, uh, let's say, raise awareness with the coaches to coach on heart rate data, let's say, improve the results of an average training and to help people to enjoy running more and more. The app will be launched. I will go to the last slide. We will be at the uh, Health Hackathon, by the way, in say Utrecht, later in April with KPMG. We're launching on Saturday in App Store, so it's free. You can download it and try it out yourself. You need a heart rate monitor, of course, and let us know what you think about it. If you want to be a coach, yeah, uh, we're ready to uh, start supporting coaches and trainers. Let us know will support you in making sure you do a better job uh, using heart rate data. That's my last slide. So I'm Dijk Marcel with the, the launch of the app store. Thanks uh, very much. Uh, um, I suggest looking at the time schedule that we take one question while uh, the next speakers uh, set up uh, the laptop. If there are any questions. Can I use it uh, for, for cycling as well? Yes. Uh, it's, it's, it's a protocol tuned for running. <laughs> it's tuned for running. We work with the cyclists too. So that's our next step on the roadmap. But we're waiting for communities to engage with us. And tell the business case was the following. Our marketing department wanted to have a cool event around the Olympics. Um, inviting journalists and sharing some insights and interesting insights around skating. Um, so our challenge then was to get data to analyze. And that wasn't as simple as, as it might seem. So eventually um, we approached the Dutch Skating uh, Union. Um, we tried to work with t Innovation Lab. Uh, they have lots of data. Uh, but unfortunately, it was too short notice to, uh, for them to be able to share that data. Uh, so we ended up with speedskatingresults.com. That's one of the major sites where you can find all the skating results. Uh, and there's another one that's called speedskatingstats.com. Uh, they work closely together. Um, but as you can see from the, uh, from the slide here, the data is not in a really usable form to analyze. So it's not in the format of an analytical base table with rows and columns. Uh, and this is just one file. So every event is stored in one file. Uh, so we ended up downloading 19,342 files 
in this form. Um, uh, but then that wasn't complete yet because I had a uh, I had a question I had a thesis that I wanted to test, um, namely, how do athletes increase performance, decrease performance based on their age. So I needed to know how old they were exactly during a race. So you need birth dates, etc., uh, which was on a different part of, this, of the site. Uh, and there was a kind of a hassle to bring it all together, put it in the right format. So uh, fortunately, and we had very little time. But I have a son. Was very handy with Python, who studies at the University in Groningen, doing AI. So he built the data set for us. Then we imported it into SaaS, did some enrichment, uh, and then the fun could begin. So what you see here is the silence before the storm, where uh, Joran, me, and the former colleague, Long Hao Lam, were digging into that data, trying to figure out what the hell we, we could do about it that would be interesting enough to present to a couple of sports journalists. Um, and, uh, well, we did, eventually. So we made it, uh, because I, I will uh, let Joran talk about that. Um, but my question was, um, how does age relate to sport results, speed skating results? So as you might remember from your biology classes, uh, the, your biological peak as a human is around your 27th birthday. So when you're 27 years old, you're at your peak. And as you can see from the data here, this is the, for the 10 kilometer skating, uh, the age development. Um, and that's, well, very clear that your peak performance is at your 27th year. But as you can also see from the red dots here in the bottom, uh, that doesn't work for Sven Kramer. Dutch speed skating champion. Um, so the next question we had was, well, how does this look like for the real top skaters? Because these are amateur skaters. A anyone who participates in an event, a 10 kilometer event, is in this data set. Uh, so it's a nice curve, but if you look at the Olympic skaters, so anyone who ever participated at the Olympics, uh, you see that this curve is, well, actually quite flat. So the laws of biology apparently don't, don't count for Olympic skaters. Uh, and again here you see that, that Sven Kramer is actually an outlier. Uh, and there's another outlier who uh, performed very well up to a very high age. Does anyone know, remember who that was? Bob de Jong, yeah, everyone knows him. So he participated at the Olympics when he was 38 years old, so that's quite unusual if you look at the, all, the, all the other data. But, um, well, that was one of the insights that, uh, that we got from the data. Um, but it doesn't predict anything yet. So to look at the real interesting stuff, I will hand over the microphone to Joel. I have already one. Oh, you are uh, wired up. Can I have this one? Thank you, Jos. So um, let's look back at the Olympic Winter Games one and a half uh, month ago. Uh, we all saw Sven Kramer at the uh, five kilometers where he won a gold medal with an Olympic record um, on, the, on the TV. And the whole, whole the Netherlands, everyone in the Netherlands was very excited about this and was looking forward at the 10 kilometers. What could go wrong? I mean, he, uh, he uh, um, won the gold medal and he had an Olympic record. However, at the 10K, uh, he didn't get even close to the gold medal. And everyone was uh, surprised, you know? Uh, how could this go wrong? So, uh, let's look at Sven Kramer after this 10K race. Gewoon te weinig. Wist je dat? Ja, dat wist ik wel. Can everyone hear this? Yes? 
No. <laughs> sure. Uh, gewoon te weinig. Wist je dat? Ja, dat wist ik wel. Dat is toch gek, hè? Dat hebben wij allemaal niet kunnen zien. Uh, toch? Hadden wij dat kunnen zien? Ja, als je naar mijn 5 kilometer kijkt, dan zie je dat wel. Als je, als je mij vraagt wel. Weet je, ik reed vorig jaar 66. So, Sven Kramer said, looking at my 5k, uh, I already expected this result. So, um, Jacques Ori, his coach, uh, he is a, a speed skating coach. Um, who uses a lot of data. He's a very, uh, he uses data anal analysis very much in his work as a coach. So uh, he should already know, right? It's no surprise for him. Maar het is niet wat we wilden. Nee, precies. Maar uh, Sven Kramer zei eigenlijk al vooraf, wist ik al dat dit een uh, moeilijk verhaal zou worden. Wist jij dat ook al? Nee. Nee. Chuck Ori didn't know. Speed skating coach, using a lot of data analysis, didn't know, uh, he didn't expect this result. Uh, also, um, the um, uh, journalist from the NOS didn't know, uh, most of the um, people in the Netherlands didn't know, but Sven Kramer, he didn't know, uh, using uh, the time of his 5K. Well, uh, who is right? Luckily, we have the data. Let's look at the data. If this thing does work. Let me explain to you uh, what we see over here. Um, these are all the competitions, uh, uh, Tetjan Bloeme and Sven Kramer skated um, during the past uh, 11 years, where they um, skated the 5K and the 10K on this one competition, which is, um, well, a very usual combination in speed skating. So, um, well, the orange dots are uh, Tetjan Bloeme and the, the blue dots are Sven Kramer. Um, so, for example, uh, this dot is from, uh, is from Sven Kramer, and uh, on this um, specific competition, he skated uh, the five kilometer in 370 seconds, and skated the 10 kilometer in 780 seconds. So, well, we can see some kind of correlation between these two variables, which is it makes sense, right? If you uh, are um, very, um, very fit at some uh, particular competition, and if you can deal very good with with the uh, um, conditions on this track, um, well, then both distances should be good, right? So, is this correlation different between those two skaters? Um, at the top we see um, uh, the results of Sven Kramer, and at the bottom the results of Tetjan Bloeme. And um, colored are the uh, competitions uh, at the Olympic Games, Pyeongchang, Sochi and Vancouver. Uh, well, you see uh, for uh, Tetjan Bloeme this was his first Olympics. So, now let's look at the result. Uh, of, um, of the Olympic Games in Pyeongchang. What we see over here is the result of Sven Kramer in Pyeongchang. So, what do you think? Is this uh, in line uh, with the expectation? Not exactly, but it is quite close, and it's also between the bandwidth you should expect. So, this is... Uh, uh, he, he skated a little slower than we. Uh, 
Um, so Sven Kramer skated a little bit slower than we expected, but it is quite in the in the range of expectations. So let's look at um, at Tetjan Blume. He was skating a very good uh, competition in Pyeongchang. He also skated a little bit faster than uh, we should expect, but it's also in the range of expectations. So were this really uh, surprisingly results for us? So let's build some simple linear regression model on this. So this is a very, very simple linear regression. Um, predicting the 10k uh, time in seconds using uh, as a um, uh, explaining variable the 5k time and as we can see um, well you cannot uh, see it really good over here but um, the predicted time for Tetjan Blume was 12 minutes 48 seconds. And the predicted time for Sven Kramer in Pyeongchang was 12 minutes 55 seconds. So was Sven Kramer right? He could, he could really expect it to lose from Tetjan Blume. The, the prediction um, is not that accurate. It's um, a couple of seconds uh, a um, couple of seconds above, and this is a couple of seconds uh, underestimated uh, it. But Sven Kramer was right. He could already see that um, the expectation was for him to lose from Tetjan Blume. So, some people uh, heard something about this. Also, uh, SBS, SBS says, uh, Hart van Nederland, they uh, asked us um, to predict the uh, results of the 1,000 meters in Pyeongchang, which were uh, at, uh, uh, well, th this was at the 22nd of February. And uh, one day later, the 1,000 meters will be uh, held in uh, Pyeongchang. So they asked us, can you also make a prediction about the results uh, tomorrow? So we said, well, why not? We have, a, we have a model, we can use it, right? Uh, so uh, we used uh, the same trick uh, for, uh, uh, for the 1,000 meters. Um, a very usual uh, combination uh, at uh, speed skating competitions is to uh, skate the uh, 1,000 meters and the uh, 1,500 meters, or uh, the 1,000 meters and the 500 meters. So for example, Kai um, Verbij, uh, you, you can see uh, also for him uh, a very strong uh, linear uh, correlation between his 500 meters time and his uh, 1000 meters time. Um, so we, pr we predicted uh, 108.4 uh, and um, the result uh, was uh, uh, 2. Uh, tenth of a second uh, above. Uh, for Kjeld Nijs, we expected uh, 107.7. Uh, we were also uh, um, uh, ten, one, two tenths of a second uh, uh, under. Uh, Lawrenson, we didn't uh, predict really well on that one, uh, luckily, uh, because uh, now uh, Kjeld Nijs um, Kjeld Nijs won uh, the 1,000 meters, and uh, we at, were uh, at the office uh, looking, uh, looking at this uh, uh, speed skating competition. Um, we also invited some journalists uh, uh, to watch with us. Also, uh, Mariana Timmer uh, was there. You can also uh, see me at the background over here, <laughs> <laughs> if you look very, very really well. Uh, also, uh, Jos, um, Nico van Ypere, that's right, he is a, a, a professor at the uh, Rijksuniversiteit Groningen in uh, um, sportpsychologie. So, 
um, journalists uh, uh, wrote some uh, uh, articles about us. Uh, Gooi en Eemlander, Noord-Hollands Dagblad. And also the, the Volkskrant uh, was at our, uh, at our office. And they uh, wrote this article. Uh, waren dit de laatste verrassende plakken? Were those the last um, Olympic medals that surprised us? Well, personally, I don't think currently those were the last surprising um, Olympic medals. Um, but I do believe that there is a big advantage using sports analytics um, to uh, have the, the best expectations of your um, um, uh, performance uh, in a competition uh, and also uh, um, uh, have the best training uh, schedule. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, do there, uh, do anybody have some questions? Um, uh, well, in the view of entertainment, uh, yes, it is. But uh, for science, it's very, uh, very interesting. Mm I no, I I don't really know, uh, but but he, I know he uses a lot of data to um, um, uh, predict if somebody is a talent. So I think he uses training data, uh, competition data, but I don't know the details. Maybe somebody here does know. Yes. Some more questions? No? John, I love this uh, very interesting story. Of quite a crusade that you had. Yes. Really cool outcome. So thanks for sharing. Thanks. Okay, thanks Walter for the introduction. Uh, so nine months ago I started working on a project called uh, FitHex, and let me quickly tell you what it's all about. Um, so I think Marcel already asked the audience how many people are using smart devices to monitor their heart rate while exercising. Um, so what is exactly the purpose of using these uh, devices? So they collect data that looks like this, so usually it's uh, second by second measurements of uh, stuff like heart rate and speed and maybe power if you're cycling. Um, do we use these devices to be able to gaze at charts like these? I don't think so. Um, so there's usually something else, some higher purpose in life. We want to participate in big events. And this is the stuff that makes us tell stories uh, impress our friends, impress our family, and that's what we use these devices for. We want to get better, we want to be as well prepared as possible at the start of events like this. So how do you usually prepare for events? Uh, you can go to a coach. Um, there are some practical concerns. So these coaches, they have they are human beings, they have quite limited experience, they know at most a few thousand athletes. Uh, they coach many people, so they're not available 24 hours a day for you. Uh, and they charge some money, uh, especially the really good ones, they can be quite expensive. Um, so you can also try to do some self-help and, and read a lot of books and, and study all the theory behind um, 
exercise physiology and try to find your own training plans. But also that takes a lot of time and takes quite some mental effort, uh, usually something that people do not want to spend. Um, so FitHex is live for like six months now and I collected data from uh, some hundred uh, test users. So this is a subpart of this population, these are the runners. And what we see is every line, every colored line represents one single runner and what we see is their trend of their peak performance uh, for a heart rate zone 3, which means it's, it's a moderate level uh, intensity exercise. So what we can see is per athlete if that person, he or she improved uh, or maybe got worse over time. And we already can see that these are all people that already use uh, these fancy electronic devices uh, for many years. And as such, they promise us to make us better. But, but what we can see from this is that, well, roughly the average of the population is stagnant, do not really, really get better. There are even some people that are getting worse. But there are some outliers that have very nice uh, positive improvement. So what about that we try to learn from these people that are improving how they're doing it and transfer that knowledge to the people uh, that are slightly behind? So how would, would you do that? Um, this is a very basic uh, feedback loop of improvement that you can see in all the uh, management literature, etc. Uh, so in this case, um, what you can do is uh, measuring, and that produces the kind of plots that you saw before. You just get second by second point measures of things like heart rate and speed. Um, the second step is you need to give these measurements some meaning because just measuring data uh, doesn't get you anywhere. And to give it meaning, you need to attach the measurements to some kind of goal. If you don't have any goal, uh, it's, it's really, really hard to give meaning to data. So if you have meaning uh, which relates these measurements to your goal, uh, that gives you maybe some knowledge to start giving advice to people on what to do which in turn generates new data and we can get into some kind of virtuous circle of improvement. So again, we have these point measurements. Um, so this is, uh, happens to be one of my most recent workouts. So I'm doing some intervals and what you can see is, if you look closely, uh, for example here, at the start of the interval, the speed immediately goes up. I mean, you can, you can accelerate if you run from 10, 10 kilometers per hour to 15 kilometers per hour in a few seconds. But your heart rate, which is the blue line, is lagging a bit behind. So it takes a minute maybe before your heart rate gets into some kind of stable uh, state. So it means as to get a meaningful measure of performance from this data, uh, just looking at speed doesn't make sense because we just, just can keep pushing ourselves harder and we go faster, but it doesn't say that we improved our performance. Uh, so we, performance should be expressed as some relationship between speed and heart rate. Um, so to capture this relationship, uh, you should take the relevant points from activities like these and take, for example, four weeks of data of such activities and that creates a perspective that looks like this. So this is an actual screenshot from the application. Um, what you can see is that the heart rates are divided by uh, intensity zones. So zone 5 is the highest intensity zone. Zone 0 is the lowest intensity zone. Um, what you can see is the actual speed that I'm getting per zone. So this gives in one glance my relative strengths and weaknesses. So, for example, the, the two lower zones are relatively underdeveloped in my case, um, while the, the mid zones are uh, very well developed in my case. Um, in addition, you can compare this with a given baseline. So, I can see that uh, related to four weeks ago, I improved most in this uh, zone too. So instead of 
clicking through all these kinds of detailed data in, in the uh, time series that we saw here, uh, this gives uh, an immediate overview of my current performance. Um, what can we use this for? What is its meaning to, uh, to our target? So if my target would be, for example, to run a PR on, on a 10 kilometer uh, race, um, what, what is the relationship between this performance profile and a good uh, 10 kilometers? So I'm currently researching this relationship. And what you see, that this is uh, data from some 100 races uh, from this population that I have, is that the relatively, the, the slower runners, you see a correlation um, between zone two, which is on the x-axis, and their 10k racing speeds, which we see on the y-axis. So for the, for the people that run a 10k race slower than 14 kilometers an hour, there's quite a good correlation between their zone two speed, which they obtain by training and, and working out, and their 10k finish time. But what we can see for the faster part of the population that runs the 10k with, with speeds higher than 14 kilometers per hour is that zone four is the best predictor for your race time. And the lower zones don't really matter. In this case, it shows that zone four is also not really relevant for the slower runners. So these two charts show that uh, although it's quite preliminary and there is not uh, a whole lot of data, uh, that this performance profile is somehow predictive for race results. Finally, also common knowledge among coaches that uh, beginning runners and slower runners are always uh, running too fast in their uh, training. And that's also visible here because this is the correlation for zone zero between the speed obtained in zone zero and the race speeds. What we see here is that there's only data uh, for people that run a 10K faster than 14 kilometers per hour. So the slower part of the population simply does not exercise in zone zero. So that's the, what most coaches always say, to get faster you need to run slower. And that is being shown here in this chart. So it shows that there is a relationship between this uh, performance profile and uh, race performance. So it also means that you can uh, reason backwards and given that you have some goal, for example, I want to run a 10K in 45 minutes, I need some given performance profile, that, that, that inference you can make from the data. So then the question is, the next step is you can uh, look at the data over time. So in the previous overview, we saw the, the, the performance profile at a given moment in time, and this is spread out over all my history. And the colors are not really well, you can see, for example, that um, there is a gap here in, in February. I was ill, and then I picked up training again. And for example, my zone two performance really went up like a rocket, while my performance for zone zero and one was relatively stagnant. So somehow, the activities that I chose to perform had a big impact on my zone two performance, but did not really have an impact on zone zero performance and zone one performance. So this leads to the second type of relationship that you're looking for in this evaluation part of this uh, reinforcement loop of learning, which is the relationship between the type of activities that we do and the improvements that we get over time in, in particular zones. So there is one relationship between this performance profile and your potential to get a time at a race, and the second relationship is between what we do in activities and how this performance profile will change. And given these two relationships, uh, we can summarize the added value of FITEX, which is there are people with goals, our heroes, and they are somewhat overwhelmed usually by all these detailed uh, data and do not manage to get the value out of it. So what we can do is learn from the best performers how they are training and translate it to advice 
to the ones that are stagnant and make them improve their PR the next time. So about the status of uh, FitHex, I'm, uh, it's just a project, it's not a business yet. Um, and, well, being a one-person army that makes a really badass movie poster, uh, but in reality, this guy will probably have a very low probability of survivorship uh, in, in this war that he's fighting. So the same for me, I'm looking for a co-founder. Uh, if any of you is interested in marketing, in UX design, uh, maybe even in uh, exercise physiology and want to join, please uh, let me know. Uh, in addition, I'm looking for additional beta testers, people that run or cycle or speed skate or whatever, and they're on Strava. Uh, the app is available for free. You can sign up at fithex.com with double X. Are there any questions? Yes, please. Yeah, um, nice presentation. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, I mean, this is uh, an app on a phone or a smart uh, uh, It's a yeah, responsive web application. Yeah. So is it possible to access more data than only the physiological data, such as uh, the age of the person, the time uh, uh, of day? Outdoor There's much more than just what I've shown here. Okay. For simplicity, I reduced it to heart rate and speed, but uh, the time of day, location, uh, age and weight uh, can, be, can be gotten, yes. Because I can imagine that affects your performance as well. And you could factor out these influences yeah. and then get a better estimate of your performance. Exactly, okay. yeah. yeah. One final question. All clear. Okay. Everyone is uh, ready for some drinks. Thanks all. Jonathan, thanks a lot. No man, no law can stop him. <laughs> Our very own Rambo. So everyone, thanks a lot for uh, being here uh, tonight.